If an extraterrestrial mind control parasite fell from the sky to Netflix and chill with you, what would you do? These three friends thought straining themselves out in the boonies would make for the ideal girls weekend, but they didn't count on an interplanetary party crasher sliding into their DMs. Now they're stuck catering to a needy lump of rancid flesh with telepathic pickup lines. And that's not the worst of it. Turns out, this thing's got big plans for their fertile young bodies. Plans that put the entire human race in Jeopardy. I'm going to break down the mistakes made, what you should do, and how to beat the body invader in the sea. After Ubering out to the Mojave Desert, longtime besties Heather Deirdre and Charlotte arrive at Heather's family vacation home to spend the weekend killing brain cells and staring up at the sky. Three hot babes stargazing. Call it whatever you want, D. We all know the real reason you're here is because none of your insta-famous followers can stand being around you long enough to invite you to any of their middle-of-the-nowhere mansion parties. Seriously though, this place has Project X written all over it, and not one of you could find anyone else willing to tag along. Must be a birds of a feather type situation going on here. Speaking of which, let's meet our three contestants, shall we? Kicking things off, we have yoga instructor and human doormat, Heather. Namaste. Her dad owns this place, but in case you forget, she'll bring it up anytime someone sneezes too hard or a space armadillo lands in the swimming pool. As we'll find out, she does really well in a crisis, just as long as it doesn't involve being assertive or making decisions of any kind. We'll give her a starting survival assessment of Paralyzed Chipmunk. Next on the chopping block is the insufferable influencer, Deirdre. Livestream! Yeah, and wouldn't you believe it if I said she was launching her own makeup line? She's pretty much co opted this entire experience to use as fodder for her social media presence. And there's not a single person on earth that's gonna stop her. Here's hoping all that extra backbone serves her well when the puppy dog eyes come out. We'll start her off at Blind Raccoon. Finally, we have the unplugged pet store wagey Charlotte. I don't want likes. Then get off my channel, Luddite. Anyway, her total lack of social media pretty much makes her the anti Deirdre. But don't let that fool you into thinking she'll be the voice of reason on this voyage. No. She's got a bleeding heart that'd make Pete a blush, and here in about five minutes, it's practically gonna burst out the front of her chest like alien. We'll call her Mortified Penguin. And that's the lineup. Which of these winners do you think will ultimately make it out alive? Let me know in the comments. While our little chat alien is plotting world domination, you can build your own dragon empire by collecting over a thousand dragons with different elements and rarities in the free-to-play mobile game Dragon City. Breeding dragons is no easy task. It'll take a key an eye for talent to collect the right dragons. Choose which ones to breed together to create a new dragon species, let alone feeding and training them with new attacks. Yes, attacks. Did you think this was about creating a petting zoo or some Jurassic World exhibit? No, you're taking them into battle against other dragon masters in PvP to compete for the reigning title of best dragon master. You'll likely lose a lot, but that's okay. Pain is information, and with each loss, you can learn how to create better dragon species. You'll need to invest your initial meager earnings into growing and personalizing your city to reach new levels and eventually flex on the noob dragon masters. If you need a break from PvP, you can complete exciting weekly mini games to claim daily prizes and catch new dragons. There's a handful of dragons you really want to focus on collecting into your stable. The Walking Dead dragons, Negan, Maggie, Rick, Carol, Daryl, and Michonne dragons will make a powerhouse. To collect all the exclusive The Walking Dead dragons, download Dragon City with a link in the description or QR code, and you'll get a free starter pack of 15,000 food, 30,000 gold, and the epic zombie nature dragon. Thanks Dragon City for sponsoring this video. The girls get settled in head of tonight's festivities. Apparently, they're in the perfect position to watch the greatest meteor shower since Chicxulub. Eventually, nighttime rolls around, but right away things take a turn for the worse. The Wi-Fi went down. Now how are we supposed to share grainy, out-of-focus pictures of the night sky with thirsty dudes online? Plus, it turns out the cell service cut out too. Good thing we didn't leave ourselves totally dependent on summoning a ride from many miles away. Oh, wait, that's that's exactly what we did. I'm sure it'll all straighten itself out eventually. Time to knock back some margaritas and reminisce about the good old days. You know, back when Heather was totally spineless, Deirdre was really mean, and Charlotte was overly sensitive. At some point in the conversation, it devolves into a this is how the world works speech by the person who spends all day taking pictures of herself. See, there are three kinds of people. Dicks, pussies, and assholes. Just as she's getting to the moral of the story, the cosmos takes a shit in her pool. What the holy? Huh? 
Wow, that was a close one. A few feet towards the house and Deirdre's next post would have been in the obituaries. The hell is this thing anyways? I'm no geologist, but I'm pretty sure meteorites don't float and leak. Naturally, Heather's more concerned with her dad's reaction to the mystery goop spilling out onto the pool than the fact that her friends nearly wound up on a live leak video. Cause obviously it's their fault Mother Nature picked here and now to hack up an oyster. Using the pool skimmer net, the girls fish the strange blob out of the water and plop it down on a towel to protect the hardwood. I don't mean to backseat drive, but you might want to grab something more substantial to put it in, like a plastic tub or a garbage can. Also, for the love of God, PPE. We have absolutely no idea what this thing is, so there's no telling what could happen if some of that squid ink squirts into your eyes. Oh, or we could just huddle around it with our mouths wide open and make wild assumptions about what it might be. Actually, never mind. It sounds like Deirdre might have cracked this one wide open. Ever hear of Bo bombs. It's a big old frozen chunk of sh some meteor shower this turned out to be. Using her keen powers of observation, Eliza Thornberry discovers a face right where the space peanut should be. Apparently, we're looking at some kind of chicken fried armadillo that fell from the sky. Someone might want to check my math on this one, but I think that that makes it an alien. I mean, how else could you explain this thing hurtling through the atmosphere? Besides, it doesn't look like any armadillo I've ever seen. It could be a bear mated with an armadillo. Yes, of course, and the resulting progeny was so malformed and grotesque, Papa Bear set it on fire and drop kicked it into the stratosphere. Jesus, you're supposed to be the smart one. Well, regardless of whether it's E.T.'s pet rat or a distant cousin of Man Bear Pig, this thing has biohazard written all over it. We should probably stay as far away from it as possible until we can get Mike Rowe to come and haul it off to Tyson Foods. That said, since we're already hovering over the potentially disease-ridden carcass, might as well snap a quick photo so we can look back on this moment and laugh when its species takes over the planet. Hmm, that's weird. Looks like now our phones aren't working at all. I wonder if it has anything to do with our new best friend. Oh, well, might as well go back to slamming down shots of tequila instead of working out how to inform the rest of society about what may be the single greatest discovery in human history. No big deal. The next morning, the girls wake to find the comm situation hasn't improved. And without even a landline they can use to call for help, they're basically completely hosed if something goes terribly wrong. The good news is Deirdre was able to get one final live stream out before losing service. So about 800 of her followers know who she's with and roughly where they are. At least this way the cops will eventually be able to piece together their location if a missing persons report gets filed. Of course by then they could very well be feeding buzzards out in the sagebrush. Especially since there's no telling how many of those 800 thirst lords own a windowless van. I think the best option right now would be to load up on water and sunscreen and hoof it back the way we came until we either find cell service or someone to give us a ride back to town. Besides, we should probably get someone to address the rotten space junk sticking up the backyard. Speaking of which, it seems our little bundle of joy has disappeared. Oh, and look, there's some drag marks leading off into the backyard. Awesome. Yeah, it's time to leave. Anything that falls from outer space and doesn't die cannot be trusted. Besides, with a slug trail like that, we could be dealing with a full-blown slither invasion one of us gets got. Just be on the safe side. Oh, never mind. Deirdre found an ancient war stick that we can use to stave off the flood infection forms. What? No, the safe side would be using all the remaining liquor at our disposal to burn the entire estate to ashes and never coming back. There's absolutely no reason to go looking for this thing, especially if there's any chance of it still being alive. <laughs> Knock yourself out. Maybe even split up while you're at it. Following a brief search, the girls find the newly unraveled armadillo monster face down in the grass, but just as they're about to issue a few safety smacks, a surprise visit from one of the locals scares them half to death. It seems our luck might be changing. This acne-ridden mouth breather, Brett, is here to do the landscaping. And judging by the fact that he's here in not a sun-bleached skeleton on the side of the road, he must have some kind of transportation. Go on. Ask him. Yes, finally, one of you grows a brain. Let's just hope he drives something with more than one seat. The thing? He can take it away? 
Oh my god, forget about the thing. You realize, even if it's gone, you're still stranded out here without cell phone service. Priority number one is getting back to civilization. Once we get that sorted out, we can then send someone out whose job it is to do that job. Besides, the meteor shower's already over. I'm sure there's plenty of trust fund babies back in LA that'll let you hold your trashy ass photo shoot beside their pool. No sense in hanging around this dump waiting to get rained on by more space vermin. Playing to their strengths, the group sends Heather to timidly approach the young man and ask him for his help removing the gremlin from the backyard, but they didn't count on him being such a shrewd negotiator. The way he sees it, Critter Gitter doesn't fall under his job description. That's like another department. Yeah, it's called the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife. For real though, this is entirely unnecessary. Brett's phone somehow seems to be working just fine. How about instead of haggling with him to do something he couldn't care less about, we ask him to lend us his phone for a five minute cold, a fishing game, and have this mess sorted out at the taxpayer's expense. Applied with cash and the promise of a link to the upcoming photo shoot, Brett goes to check out the mystery meat, which he immediately realizes is no armadillo, cause he has at least one working eyeball. Naturally, he sees this development as grounds to reneg. Probably a smart move. Photos of scantily clad women aren't exactly difficult to come by these days, and it's gonna cost him a lot more than $150 to buy yourself a new body when the blob over here starts eating you alive from the inside. However, before he can walk out on the deal completely, it turns out there actually is something they can offer him that's apparently worth the risk of contracting an alien super virus. Okay, let's get this over with. One quick kiss. Way to take one for the team there, Charlotte. Although, I gotta say, for his role in this operation, that still seems a tad light. Kinda makes you wonder if he didn't already run this rack on any of the other luxury mansions in the area. I mean, that'd be quite a grift for the industrious teenager, chucking extra crispy critters into swimming pools and then extorting the owners for their removal. Props. Having received his payment, Sideshow Bob grabs a tarp and a shovel and goes to hold up his end of the bargain. Only it proves a bit more difficult than he might have initially realized. Come on, dude, put your back into it. This thing's the size of a cabbage patch, kid. How heavy could it possibly be? Good thing Charlotte's not around to see you struggling to move this thing. I think you really have a shot with her. How about instead of taking this thing all in one go, you put that keen business intellect to good use and hack it apart with a shovel? I mean, it's already dead, right? Oh, shit. Or not. Can't say I blame Pizza Face for hauling out of there. No amount of kisses is worth sticking around to figure out what got that thing kicked out of the Muppets. Kid's got good instincts. We'll give him a survival rating of Rapid Goat. Now, as you could probably imagine, seeing the guy you just paid to drag off what you think is an armadillo, sprinting away like the place is on fire is probably a good sign that something went horribly wrong. Maybe, instead of standing around watching him slowly disappear into the distance, you should try and go after him to figure out what's got him so worked up. You know, in case Mama Flying Toad Bear just swooped in to collect her missing child. Throwing caution to the wind, the girls round the corner to find the R.O.U.S. writhing around in the hot SoCal sun. I can already hear Charlotte taking this thing's side like it isn't homelier than a mud fence. She'll probably be blowing raspberries on the thing's stomach by sundown. Anyway, a debate then ensues between Charlotte, who wants to enroll it in preschool, and Deirdre, who knows that sometimes dead is better. Naturally, Heather abstains because, of course, she does. Besides, her primary concern is still her dad taking her allowance when he finds out that they had an alien crash land in their backyard. He's not mad, he just wishes you used better judgment. Yeah, gotta go with Regina George on this one. The spud must die. It sickens me. You want to kill it. You're goddamn right I want to kill it. The question is how. For all we know, flying rat bears are protected under the Migratory Birds Act. So if we're gonna bash its face in with the war club, we'd better be prepared to bury it in case the feds come knocking. And poison, as Deirdre suggests, is right out. I'm not staying close to that thing long enough for it to breathe deep from the bag of visions. Nor am I gonna massage a bottle of sleeping pills down its throat. Nah. I think the best option is to just leave it the hell alone and let Mojave do its thing. After all, we still have to figure out how we're getting out of here. Eventually, a compromise is reached from Heather of all people. The plan is just to haul it away from the house on the tarp and leave it in the shade. Let Jesus take the wheel. We could leave it a bowl of water. 
I like where your head's at, except think bigger. Let's leave it a Rubbermaid trash can full of water and then drop it in. I mean, if we can lift it. What is this thing, crap dark matter or something? After working themselves to the point of exhaustion, the girl successfully moved the thing a good 10 yards closer to the house before giving up and leaving it out in the direct sunlight. Yeah, something tells me a bowl of water is not gonna cut it here. Oh, well, it doesn't seem too upset about it, especially since you've given it a front row seat to your OF shoot. Seriously, does no one see Boo Boo Bear grinning ear to ear right now? Whatever, nothing to do now but get bombed out of our minds in triple digit heat and take lewd photos of one another. Hmm, kind of strange the digital camera works just fine, but all three of your phones won't even open to settings. Weird. With today's festivities concluded, everyone settles in to sleep it off. Well, almost everyone. Old Rufus decided now's the perfect time to start screaming its head off again. God, what's it want now? We already gave it a nice patch of grass to die on. Why can't it just shrivel up and let us get back to our lives? Oh, and guess who answers the call of duty? Don't worry, you little hemorrhoid. Charlotte's coming to cater to your every whim, but not before dragging Heather out of her REM sleep. Way to make your misplaced compassion everyone else's problem. I'm sure we totally won't regret helping it later on. The bear thing? It's crying. Come see it. Don't you just love it when your friends wake you up in the middle of the night so the two of you can shelp a 300 pound naked mole rat across the lawn? Yeah, me neither. Good on Heather for telling her where to shove it. Maybe I misjudged her. Left to her own devices, Charlotte heads outside intent on hauling her precious ray of sunshine into the house solo. Better lift with your legs. The three of you could barely drag this thing across the ground. How do you expect to- I, oh, I guess it's super easy now. Great. Conservation of mass be damned. It's almost like the universe wants you to lug this disgusting lump into the living room. But wait, young Charlotte's just getting warmed up. Now she's gotta feed the thing. Hope it's not after midnight. Although, I honestly can't see it getting any uglier. The next day, Deirdre awakens for her morning protein shake, only to find the empty bottle laying next to the sleeping dog rat. I wonder who put that there. Jesus, you could have at least tried hiding the fact that you fed it to the thing. I mean, she already wants to beat its brains in with a club. Something tells me this didn't change her mind. Seething with rage, she drags Charlotte out of bed to rub her nose in the mess she made. Now, don't be too hard on her. I mean, she had a good reason, right? I was crying. I it was crying. It's this style of parenting that leads your children to grow up strangling people in truck stop bathrooms. Besides, do you speak Space Goblin? For all you know, this thing was asking you to shovel the top of its head off and put it out of its misery. It seems Heather's also had enough of Charlotte's inane nurturing, especially knowing her dad is gonna blow a forehead vein if he finds out they spilled protein shake on the floor. She orders her friend to get rid of this thing once and for all. But before Charlotte can even get it off the ground, the runt comes completely unglued in an ear-splitting conniption. Yeah, that's it. I'm getting the stick. It's time to say goodbye to Dobby, folks. Sonic attacks are where I draw the line. Oh, but it was just defending itself. My animal rights. Nope, don't care. It should have found a less annoying form of self-defense. Unfortunately, it seems Deirdre's lost interest in splattering this thing across the floor. Then again, Heather might literally kill the next person to screw something up in her dad's house. Either way, she sentences Charlotte the hitchhiker way to town so they can call in C or Milan to come whip this thing into shape. According to Heather, there's a reclusive old lady living nearby that they might be able to catch a ride with. And being the good friend that she is, she volunteers to go along for the ride. So the two hop into Polaris and head down the road. Oh yeah, turns out they've had a fully operational UTV they could have used this entire time. Why am I not even surprised? I mean, if it were my ass on the line here, I would have used that thing yesterday morning when we realized there was still no cell service. Or maybe when our little house guest changed chased off the gardener. Oh, that's right. We had very important partying to do. Why does that sound so familiar? I wonder if they're related to Carrie and Tia from Corn. Actually, on second thought, they're probably related to Dee Dee. Upon reaching Edna's old homestead, they find a seemingly operational pickup parked out front, but no sign of anyone inside. Oh, well, nice of her to leave the door unlocked. I'm sure she won't mind if we totally invade her privacy and go poking around the war room. After all, the kind of people that keep stuff like this in their living room are generally pretty laxed about security. Unfortunately, it seems the landlines out here aren't working either, and with no indication as to when the homeowner might be back, Heather decides they should just leave a note on her table and head back out to the house. Except, why would we do that? We've got the UTV, don't we? Let's just take it down the road we came in on until we find the nearest town. A Polaris Razor like theirs can go well over 100 miles on a single tank of gas, and if they're low, then, well, screw it. Find a length of rubber hose and siphon some gas out of the pickup. Might as well look around for the 
keys while we're at it, given we've got a demon from hell resting comfortably in our house. I'd say the situation warrants an ask for forgiveness later approach. On their way out, Charlotte calls out a day planner, the night of the recent meteor shower heavily circled. Well, maybe it was her birthday. Yes, of course. And maybe to celebrate, she fired a mutant bear cub out of a howitzer into her backyard. Sure, maybe it's nothing, but it'd be worth at least snooping around a bit in case we find something useful. I mean, I'm not expecting to find a full-on anatomical drawing of the creature in her notebook. That'd be crazy. But maybe we'll find some information on why the cell signals are down. Besides, are we really in that much of a rush to get back there? Meanwhile, back at the house, Deirdre's reached her wit's end with baby Sinclair's nonstop bawling. If only some Somebody hadn't validated its cries for attention and turned it into a needy little brat. Side note, why on earth would she want to be left alone with this freak show? Crying's one thing, but I'd expect it to start running around like Chucky the moment we took our eyes off it. It may look harmless now, but that might just be what it wants us to think. Realizing there's nobody around to stop her, Deirdre decides that now would be a good time to put Junior down once and for all. She uses her special partying skills to whip up a strickening margarita, but before she can deliver the fatal dose, the sudden glassy-eyed glance from the target stops her dead in her tracks. Oh great, psychic armadillos. As if death claws and night stalkers weren't bad enough. I admire Deirdre's decisive use of her alone time with the monster. And poison was probably the only way she could get rid of this thing without catching an earful from her overly attached girlfriends. However, it does force her to get way closer to this thing than I'm comfortable with. Although it's not like she could have expected an overgrown prairie dog would have mind control powers. Sometime later, Heather and Charlotte return to find an extra chill Deirdre truck casually floating around the pool. They break the bad news about not finding anyone that can help, but it seems in the short time they've been away, she's become entirely at peace with the idea of being stranded indefinitely alongside a screeching rat bear monstrosity. It is kind of cute. Wrong. It's objectively uncute. That's a red flag if I've ever heard one. But Deirdre's drastic behavioral changes don't stop there. Apparently lounging around doing nothing all afternoon really works up an appetite. As her friends look on in disbelief, Miss Instamodel frantically wolfs down everything in sight before heading straight outside and vigorously jazzercising out in 100 degree heat. Problem is, she's so prone to episodes of bizarre behavior, Charlotte and Heather just assume it's either all the party favors they've been taking or yet another one of our characteristic nervous breakdowns. Although, it's not like either of them could ever imagine she was brainwashed by a sentient woodchuck. Speaking of which, Charlotte thinks it might be easier to keep around if it didn't reek like last week's roadkill. I mean, it'd be even easier to keep around if you burned it alive at the stake. But what do I know? Sure, whatever, let's give the baby a bath. Because it didn't shriek like a fucking banshee the last time you tried to move it. I'm sure it'll have no problem with you hauling it over to the tub of water. God, I bet your apartment's packed act like a petting zoo with all the unlovable reject animals no one wants to buy at the pet store. As for Heather, the thought of her dad walking in and finding drink rings on the coffee table is more than she can bear right now, so she tells Charlotte to knock herself out. This weekend literally cannot get any weirder. Oh boy, do I have bad news for you. It's gonna get a lot weirder, starting here in just about 30 seconds. That night, Heather wakes up to something strange going down in the living room. Just go ahead and take whatever you had in mind and toss it right out the window. Upon rounding the corner, she finds Deirdre writhing around in a massive pool of strawberry jello spilling out from Snuffle's abdomen. <laughs> I guess that explains why it was so heavy. Hey, maybe instead of standing there staring at it like it just ran your credit card, you might want to consider running away before a thing tentacle drags you screaming across the floor. Unfortunately, before Heather could tear them both a new one for ruining the carpet, the Master of Ceremonies zonks her out with the same Jedi mind trick it used on Deirdre, drawing her out of her clothes and into the cuddle puddle without even stopping to buy her dinner. Yeah, no way YouTube is gonna let me show what happens after that, but rest assured, it's the most disgusting thing I think we've ever covered since Human Centipede. I'll leave it there. Anyway, the next morning, Charlotte comes out into the living room to find the awesome possums missing. Honestly, I'm surprised she didn't break down in tears at the thought of her precious little hellspawn crying out for attention with no one around to coddle it. Outside, Heather and Deirdre are sprawled out enjoying the sunshine like it's not day three of being stranded out in the godforsaken desert. As for Tickle Me Elmo, they figured he'd be a lot more comfortable sweating it out in Deirdre's bed. What is that piss-leaking dog rat doing in the house? Get it out of my house. It stinks of ass. 
Cause yep, that checks out. With that mystery solved, Charlotte attempts to steer them back towards the matter of escaping this hellhole, but her friends would rather sit around and wait for Magic Conch to sort things out on their behalf. Sure, pretty easy to do when your primary source of income stems from booty pics and teaching people to touch their toes. Then again, it should be obvious to anyone with a pulse that they're both acting wildly out of character. Besides, even if they did tuck into the Keith Richards grab bag a little early this morning, Charlotte spent enough time around them baked to the gills to recognize this, and it all starts shortly after she brought Mr. Bigglesworth into the house. Hmm. Whatever the case, there's about a million litter boxes that need cleaning at the pet store tomorrow, so Charlotte asks if she can take the UTV back over to Edna's to try and find the truck keys. Along the way, she makes a stop at the presidential suite to check on her best bud. Well, it does look more comfortable. What's wrong, Charlotte? Is the honeymoon over? If that thing gives you the creeps at all, just remember, this is all your fault to begin with. You just had to go cooing over this thing like it was a baby goddamn Yoda. And now the only other people around for miles are caught up in some kind of jacked up pudding harem. <sighs> all right, let's see if Edna ever came back around. Charlotte arrives back at the shack to find everything exactly how they left it the day before. And there's still no sign of the big dog or the old lady. After a quick search of the truck fails to to turn up the keys, she heads inside the house to make one more pass through the hermit's belongings. No keys in here either. It's almost like she doesn't want random 20-somethings taking off on her only mode of transportation. Eventually, Charlotte makes her way to the desk and finds Edna's old notebook. Yeah, looks like nothing but a bunch of chicken scratches and stoichiometry problems to me. Oh, except what's that? It's an anatomical drawing of the Care Bear we've been bunking with. Crazy. Should probably toss this book in the razor to show Heather and Deirdre. Of course, at this point, they're probably both too whacked out of their minds to even comprehend what we're showing them. Just then, she notices light pouring in through the pair of tandem bullet holes in the nearby wall. Putting on her CSI hat, Charlotte runs around the exterior of the house until she eventually finds Edna leaning against the wall. She's not looking so hot. Damn, both barrels? I guess she really wanted to die. If she was so freaked out about this thing that she ate a buckshot sandwich, we probably should snag that side by side and any extra ammo she's got lying around. Something tells me we're gonna need it. Oh, and by the way, if you're still interested in finding those truck keys, I'd say here's your opportunity. I mean, unless Edna swallowed them before doing the deed, they're probably just sitting in one of her pockets. We probably shouldn't even bother swinging by the house. Heather and Deirdre seem quite content with rotting in that multi-million dollar dump, so I say we cut our losses and send animal control to work the place over with a flamethrower once we make it back to civilization. You already know she's She's gonna go straight back to the house. How else could we have a final showdown with the wombat and his pair of bridezellas? Upon reaching the swimming pool, Charlotte attempts to relay what she saw at Edna's cabin, but the gravity of the situation just doesn't seem to be getting through to them. That's really sad. Not as sad as you're gonna be here in a couple minutes. Finally, Dr. Goodall makes the connection between her friend's aloof behavior and her latest charity case. Taking absolutely no precaution whatsoever, she heads down into the guest room to politely ask the rat beast to not go forward with the brutal enslavement of the entire planet. But one look from young Casanova leaves her swooning at the foot of the bed. However, little does the creature realize her unusual lack of TikTok-induced ADHD makes her immune to the full effect of of its power, allowing her to break free of its grasp before it can roll out the red carpet. Now armed with the knowledge of what they're really up against, Charlotte grabs the war club in a blindfold and heads back into the room to work this thing over like a spam pinata. Now nah, actually she goes right back outside to talk it over with her clearly indoctrinated friends. You went in the room. If that's how she feels about it, it's a pretty safe bet you're no longer on the same team. Charlotte tries telling them they need to call someone to deal with this nightmare before things spiral further out of control. You know, it's only what we've been trying to do for three days at this point, but now she's super serial. It seems Heather and Deirdre have other plans. The two of them want to take this thing on tour. I mean, just look at that face, that charisma. That's your next dramatic chipmunk right there. Sorry, Charlie. These ladies are seeing dollar signs, and there'll be goddamn damn beat to hell before they let you ruin their hot new business venture with your granola eating garbage. Of course, that is if this little horror show doesn't ruin it first. Damn. Your eyes are... oh. <laughs> See, 
that's what happens when you don't like and subscribe. That extraterrestrial morning sickness just hits different. Hey, but don't worry now. Charlotte's here to gingerly wipe away the black stuff from your eyes with a washcloth. See? All better. I'm sorry I have to be the one to tell you this, but your friends are way beyond glow up at this point. You should probably focus all your effort on the source of this disaster. You know, after you find yourself some kind of weapon, preferably fire-based. Honestly, it would probably be best to just toss a Molotov cocktail in the guest room and then light the whole place up with whatever gasoline's left in the razor. Or you could just walk right in there, completely unarmed, and try strangling it to death. Yeah, go ahead and look it dead in the eyes while you're at it. It's not like it literally just did that to mind jack you like one minute ago. Realizing it's lost its charm, Gizmo hits the panic button and summons its pair of Pregasaurs to lay a big herd on Charlotte. Only they just kind of boop her against the wall before immediately leaving the room. I'm not sure why it didn't have them grab a kitchen knife or something on the way. I guess it's more of a lover than a fighter. Naturally, upon waking up, Sigourney Weaver stares straight into the hollow eyes of death yet again, which of course results in her getting mind-linked. However, this time it takes the opportunity to clearly spell out its really gross plan for world domination before spitting her back out like before. I guess it wanted to brag or something? As if we needed another reason to kill this thing. Can you wrap this up already? Knowing what must be done, Charlotte makes a quick trip upstairs to retrieve the war club from its resting place. With no one around to get in her way, she returns to the belly of the beast and ends Furby's whole career with a series of well-placed smacks. Thank god, I was running out of things to call it. It's not over yet, however. She still needs to hunt down Heather and Deirdre before they can start this shit show all over again somewhere else. Good thing they've pretty much ignored the UTV this entire time. Seriously though, as many times as they've all blown their best ticket out of this place, I'm surprised Charlotte didn't go chasing after them on foot. Oh well, their loss is our gain. And with the first of her fling friends in sight, Charlotte stomps on the gas and goes for the splatter. <laughs> Too bad it wasn't enough to kill her though. Oh no, you're gonna have to get out and settle this like Bible times. Just remember as you're smashing your best friend's brains in that this all could have been avoided had you just let the stupid fucking rap monster cry itself to sleep on the lawn. Unfortunately, running over pregnant women voids the warranty on most recreational vehicles. And with another super spreader still on the loose, it looks like we're stuck saving the human race on foot. The good news is they pretty much went in the exact same direction. Gotta say, it's kinda stupid of them to put all their eggs in one basket like that. Whatever, it's not like they can move all that fast anyway with all the extra cargo. Despite easily being able to use her forward momentum to drive that club through the back of Deirdre's skull like it was a chicken egg, Charlotte decides to square up on her opponent and settle humanity's future in a trial by combat. Not sure why she just stood there waiting for Big Mama to straight up truck stick her though. The resulting struggle nearly ends with Deirdre on top, but eventually Charlotte's able to retrieve the club and put her in the dirt. Better hurry up. You never know when a passing motorist is gonna happen by, tragically misread the situation, and feel totally justified in smoking you with a 30 odd 6. Totally unfazed by the rancid black goop all over her, the unwitting accomplice in mankind's destruction scoops Deirdre up and heads back to his truck. Except, wait, could it be? Yes, it turns out Ragtime Cowboy Joe couldn't center punch a human-sized target from 50 yards away with a scoped rifle. Apparently, Deirdre wasn't too impressed with that pathetic display of marksmanship either. Nothing says, thank you for saving my life. Quite like a total disembowelment. Not a smart move on her part, though. Now there's no one to stop us from picking up that rifle and telling her about the rabbits. That is, if somebody would hurry up and squeeze the trigger already. Damn. Do you not see the squid arm? You're gonna get ear holed just like last time. Ah, thank God. With the last of her friends face down in her own spaghetti sauce, Charlotte takes a moment to appreciate the valuable lesson she learned about killing. And with that, it's finally over. Or is it? In the end, only Charlotte made it out alive. But had we taken the first opportunity to head back into town once we knew there was a problem, we'd almost certainly could have made it out of there before the little love machine regained consciousness. As for the rest of the meteors we saw coming down, these things aren't exactly bulletproof. And without any way of moving around on their own, half of them them are going to be eaten by coyotes before they even have a chance to download Tinder. When it's all said and done, I think the seed was beaten. Moral of the story, always practice safe whatever that is. And remember to download Dragon City by clicking the link in the description or scanning the QR code.